Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Huggins. We just had him on about a month ago to talk about a whole systems approach to dentistry. There's so many things to talk about with Dr. Huggins. He is a renowned dentist who actually refused to put in mercury amalgams and lost his license as a result of it. And he is the author of 25 books, just a few you might have heard of. It's all in your head. Uninformed consent. Who makes your hormones hum? And find your ancestral diet. Dr. Huggins has his own protocol for health and wellness and works with many dentists around the country and around the world who look to him for a totally advanced approach and a whole systems approach to dentistry and to health. We're going to be talking about dental decay today because maybe it turns out that most of us don't know what it is, where it comes from, the traditional way that dentists look at dental decay, and how Dr. Huggins looks at and deals with dental decay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Hal Huggins back to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Well, thank you, Kim. It is a wonderful thing to start the day with you. You're always very uplifting, and now I am uplifted. Thank so you. Get with it. Thank you. Well, first thing I want to ask you is how do traditional dentists diagnose dental decay? And what determines whether they're going to fill a cavity and what makes for decay? Well, a dentist, number one, is going to look in the mouth because sometimes decay is uh, kind of black colored and you take a real sharp little instrument called an explorer and you poke around the tooth and if you fall into a hole, that's a cavity. Those are fairly easy to find. Uh, the majority of them are in between the teeth and here you have to see those on x-ray. So x-ray is the primary way of determining where decay is if you can't see it visually on the biting surface of the tooth or on the side of the tooth. Today, they are using digital x-rays. Do you like them? Do you not like them? Do you feel you can see better with them? Well, that's a good question. I suppose I need to come up with a good answer. Um, you know, I learned to take x-rays uh, over 50 years ago, and the quality of x-ray at that time was superb. And I don't know that the digital, and then, you know, we were using like a 30th of a second of x-ray. Well, that's not a whole lot of x-ray, and that was a whole lot better than what was available just even five or ten years before then. So I considered that uh, pretty safe and still do. But the public, of course, is more afraid of x-ray than they are of coffee, though maybe it should be the other way around. Uh, so they have come up with a digital, which uh, puts out even less x-ray. The advantage of digital is that you can alter the what's called the contrast, that is the black-white intensity. So you can turn a little knob and be able to identify x-ray where in the past, if you took a picture and it was too light, you had to come back and take another picture. Well, the advantage now is you take one picture and you can alter the contrast, the black whiteness of it, and pick up cavities easier than you could before. So, yes, it is definitely an improvement over 50 years ago, but not a great deal of improvement because, really, 50 years ago, it was uh, pretty blooming accurate. So that's another way to tell potential cavities or decay in between teeth. You were talking about that. Yes. And then you uh, cut a hole in it, and the way that I was taught was called extension for prevention. So if you've got a cavity that's uh, a sixteenth of an inch across, well, you make it about five or six sixteenths of an inch uh, to get any of the little bacteria that might be infused out into the enamel, into the dentin, and by doing that, um, you are preventing a new cavity. Well, from people who have taken pictures of people's mouths every five years, you find that's not really true. And that if you, uh, in fact, somebody told me just last week, if you, when you have your first cavity done, that's a six thousand dollar procedure. Why? Well, you know, so well when I graduated from school, it was five dollars to fill a tooth like that. Now it's about two hundred and fifty. 
But if you fill it um, with the conventional silver mercury filling, 50% mercury, then you find that, according to University of Colorado, the half-life of uh, the silver mercury filling is four and a half years. So that means at the end of four and a half years, if you placed 100 amalgam mercury fillings, 50 of them are going to have been replaced. And in another four and a half years, half of what's left is going to be replaced. So what happens is the mercury fillings do not really seal at the margins. And from the work done by Dr. Ralph Steinman at Loma Linda, I find that uh, bacteria and corrosion products are all the way around the bottom of the filling. Now, at the center we used to have here, uh, you know, we were taking out fillings because the people were reacting to mercury. And of those that did not show any decay on x-ray, look perfect on an x-ray, you take them out and 64% of them had decay underneath it that you couldn't see. So that does not really seal the tooth. Well, the $6,000, where does that come from? The filling has to be replaced. Well, when it's replaced, it's bigger. And then it has to be replaced. Well, by then it's gone into the pulp chamber, so we have to have a root canal. If you have a root canal, then you have to have a crown put on it. And in another few years, that tooth's going to be extracted. You're going to have a bridge. Then the bridge comes out, and you're going to have to have a partial. Then a few more of those, you end up with a denture. Well, you're only about 15% or so of the population end up with dentures. But in that process, before you get to that, you're going to pay $6,000 at... Uh, 2010 prices. Now, by the year 2020, it's hard telling what those prices are going to be because they have, well, look how much they escalated since I uh, went to school from $5 to $250. Well, I'm hearing the progression of how it unfolds, and it's scary. But at the cavity level, what's the problem? Let's say the cavity is not filled with mercury. Okay. It's filled with something else. Okay, they have plastic fillings, they have gold fillings. What do you recommend and what's your priority and why? Well, it depends on what the patient's priority is. Mercury, of course, is at the bottom of my priority list. I certainly would not want mercury put in my um, mouth, but that's, uh, they're still placing, they will place 100,000 mercury fillings in the United States today. So it is still a fairly popular filling. 50% of the dentists still use that. Uh, you can put in the plastics, and there are some, uh, they're called composite. There are some problems with that because uh, the ones that uh, are more compatible with the immune system uh, don't last but about five or six years. The mercury fillings may last longer than that, but the patient may not last longer than that. So any of them that you put in of that type are uh, oh, five to ten year investment. Uh, I had gold inlays put in my mouth in uh, 1974 when I found out the hazards of mercury, and uh, all the three of them are still in there. A uh, couple of them came out. I kind of bit down on it and <laughs> bent them a little bit so you couldn't put them back in. But that was a pretty good investment because they've been in there for, since 1974. So you don't have to go in and replace them as often and uh, they're not toxic. So gold, regardless of the price, if we're just talking about health, gold is still the best thing to put in, except 90% of the golds contain a whole lot of copper. And our recent research has shown that copper is one of the big problems in creating the hazards that the bacteria in root canals uh, create. So uh, dentistry is kind of hazardous to your health, and the primary reason is that uh, dentistry has avoided picking up on where does dental decay come from? Can it be prevented? Are you going to answer that? Your next question. (laughs) Um, Yes, it can be. Uh, There was a researcher back years ago, 100 years ago, Dr. Weston Price, who traveled around the world looking for populations of people who didn't have dental decay, and he found them. And he found that there was a common denominator. They did not use what he termed the foods of commerce. They were kind of isolated like the Samoan Islands, like the Eskimos, uh, people up in the mountains of uh, Switzerland, where they did not have basically sugar in their diet. 
and uh, he got permission in some areas to dig up the 